welcome. I'm Miata Fambola. Um, I'm Chief Executive of the New Economics Foundation, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome all of you to this discussion here this afternoon. Um, I'm also really delighted that we are hosting this event on how we can reshape finance and harness its benefits to catalyze the net zero transition, to catalyze leveling up both things that we you know absolutely need to happen. Uh, this is an area where NEF has long done uh, work. We've been working on this for seven years, trying to think about the solutions that would enable us uh, to uh, make that happen. Um, it's an area where, to be fair, we have seen progress um, in large part, thanks to the leadership of the Bank of England and other financial institutions. Finance is more engaged more than ever before on both climate action and the social impacts of his investment. But we also know that we are at the foothills of a big mountain that we need to climb. If we want to reshape finance, if you want to gear finance so that it can play the role that it has the potential to play in both the climate transition and in leveling up. And you know, for me, the, the two stats that always stick in my mind, always slightly take me aback, is the fact that if we look pre-pandemic, only eight to 10% of bank lending went into non-financial businesses. And a shocking three to 5% went to SMEs, despite the fact they amount for 99% of businesses, 60% of all private sector jobs. So I think the key question for policymakers, and indeed the question that we're gonna try and grapple with and confront and get underneath the skin of this afternoon, is do we need more robust interventions, policy interventions to shift the allocation of financial flows? Is what we're doing enough or do we need to go much further if we want to drive the scale and pace of change that we know needs to happen? Um, and I have no doubt that the brilliant panel that we have lined up for you this afternoon is going to spark both a lively, but a hopefully a very thought-provoking discussion on that very question. Um, before I hand over to uh, Vibeka Mir, um, many of you will know her. She's chairing us this afternoon, uh, the Sustainable Assets Manager e Editor of Capital Monitor. And she has been responsible through her absolutely outstanding work for holding many influential asset owners and managers to account for their commitment on financial sustainability. But before I hand over to you, I just wanted to say a huge thanks to our funders, Loudest Foundation Sunrise, without whose support we wouldn't be here today and we wouldn't be able to, to do this important work. But also to flag that unfortunately we've had to change um, around our speaker orders because two of our speakers have had to drop out. Uh, Sarah Beden uh, from the Bank of England cannot be with us due to urgent issues um, with regards to the conflict in Ukraine. And our, our own um, Lydia Prigg, who's our head of economics, unfortunately um, has a family situation, so has had to drop out. Uh, but you are in very good hands. You are in very good companies with the panel that we have lined up. I hope you enjoy the afternoon. I hope it makes you think. And I hope this is the start of a brilliant conversation that we'll be having. Fibeka, over to you. Um, uh, thanks, um, Miata, for, for giving us a great introduction to what I hope is going to be a lively um, debate. Um, as you said, I'm Fabika Mayer and I'm the Asset, Manager, Asset Management Editor at Capital Monitor. Um, before we get into the um, session, I'm just going to briefly introduce who I work for. So um, Capital Monitor is part of the New States and Media Group, and our mission is to explain how the world is changing for decision makers in need of data-driven answers. We help our readers to lead effectively and define policies using the same rigor and quality journalism the New Statesman magazine has long been admired for. And one of our key missions, which um, Miata touched upon, is to track the impact capital has on our environment, our societies, and institutional governance, and to hold institutions to account for the commitments they make in this respect. And we have access to huge volumes of data to try and achieve this. Um, so um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to a great debate and we're honored to have as the first speaker, I'm sure he doesn't need much introduction. Um, he's the renowned professor, Jovis Stiglitz. I've read um, many of his books and I'm sure much of our audience has as well. Um, he's had an illustrious career. Um, I'm just going to touch upon some of the things he's um, done before I introduce him to make opening remarks. So he's 
an American economist and a professor at Columbia University. He's also the co-chair of the high-level expert group on the measurement of economic performance and social progress at the OECD and the chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute. Um, he's, he's worked at the World Bank, where he's been the former senior vice president and chief economist, and also was a former chair of the US President's Council of Economic Advisors. In 2011, he was named by Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And he's written many great books, for example, People, Power and Profits, Be White in the World of the European Economy, and Globalization and Its Discontents Revisited. So an illustrious career, I'm, I'm really honored to introduce him to make some opening remarks. Thank you, Joseph. Well, thank you. And the subject I'm uh, uh, going to talk about is uh, moving towards a green economy through uh, credit. How do we use the, the credit system to uh, uh, facilitate, accelerate uh, the green transition? Now, uh, increasingly, uh, financial institutions, banks, uh, uh, companies like BlackRock that have under their uh, management trillions of dollars have made uh, very strong commitments, statements that they want to be green, that they are moving their portfolio towards uh, renewable energy. But there's a lot of concern about greenwashing. Uh, is this really happening? Uh, are they uh, in fact, in one way or another, uh, facilitating uh, the continuation of uh, carbon uh, investments. I remember a few years ago uh, having some discussions with uh, some major American banks that would be were very proud that they had installed uh, green light bulbs and uh, expressed their contribution uh, with pride, their contribution towards uh, moving towards a green economy. Meanwhile, they were lending massively to coal and oil. And uh, so uh, it was nice that they had green uh, light bulbs, but the contribution towards uh, uh, a, a uh, fossil-based uh, economy uh, from their massive lending programs overwhelmed their minuscule contributions through green light bulbs. So, uh, the underlying uh, the concern here is uh, one of the major scarce factors in our economy is capital. It's important to allocate capital efficiently. Uh, the allocation of uh, efficient allocation of capital has to be based on social cost and benefits. And there are large disparities between social costs and benefits and private costs and benefits. And those disparities between social costs and benefits and private costs and benefits, uh, they're pervasive, but are particularly important in this area because the private sector doesn't fully take into account a whole set of uh, risks, uh, costs, associated with climate change, with uh, the fact that uh, the financial market is exposed right now to huge amounts of climate risk. Uh, we distinguish two forms of climate risk. Uh, one form of climate risk is uh, the physical risk, uh, the assets, the real estate assets, that um, will be underwater, uh, uh, places that will be subject to wildfires or extreme weather events. We know that the market has not priced these real estate assets to fully incorporate these risks. There have been a large number of studies that, that show you know, some places that has happened, but in a very large fraction of uh, real estate assets have not been appropriately uh, repriced. That means that sometime in the future, they will be repriced. What we know from, for instance, the 2008 financial crisis, that the repricing of 
assets, financial assets, can have a traumatic effect on the economy. In 2008, a small fraction of a small fraction of, a, uh, 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 of the global real estate market was repriced. It was American subprime mortgages. Those were the assets that were incorrectly priced. When they were repriced suddenly in the period 2007, 2008, we had a global financial crisis. What we're talking about here is much larger problem of mispricing. And I'm gonna to come to a second part of, of the mispricing problem. But that alone is a societal problem, which the financial sector has not fully taken on board. There's another aspect of risk, which we refer to as transitional risk. I believe that a large fraction of the, of the fossil fuel assets that we currently have very high prices, price of oil is $110, are going to become what are called stranded assets. The value will be very low, perhaps zero. Some time between now and probably 2050, the price of these oil assets is going to come down, uh, oil and other fossil fuel assets, is going to come down very dramatically. Again, a large part of the asset base of the world is going to change. The prices are going to change very dramatically. That risk is what we call transitional risk. And that risk, too, is a risk to our entire financial system and therefore to our economic system. Now, almost undoubtedly, uh, when and it, it, these repricing occur and we have a financial crisis, the government will come in and engage in bailouts. It's what has happened over and over again. But that's another example of a disparity between social and private costs. Society as a whole will bear these bailout costs of bailing out the oil company, bailing out those who've invested wrongly in real estate. But it is an example of massive hidden subsidies in the allocation of capital. That the capital is re receiving a subsidy of a bailout in the future, which is not appropriately priced into the asset uh, uh, that today. It compounds a whole series of mispricing in this area. We misprice fossil fuels because there are massive, in the trillions of dollars, subsidies hidden in the tax system. So what we have is a set of massive subsidies already distorting the fossil fuel market. And now we are adding to that massive subsidies implicit through uh, risk subsidies. Uh, the risk of future bailouts, risks associated with uh, uh, economic trauma to our system. Now, given this, it is uh, only uh, any, anybody asking the question from a point of view of economic efficiency, uh, needs, putting aside uh, the direct uh, cost of carbon, would say it is imperative that our financial system reflect these social costs. And so the question I wanna spend just a few minutes now talking about is how to make that happen better. Uh, how do we make the financial system not just engage in the rhetoric that we see from places like BlackRock, but actually do what they ought, ought to do and, and make sure that the allocation of financial capital is in accord with social costs and benefits. And we have here multiple tools and we have to use all of them. Uh, I'm particularly wedded to the importance of information. <laughs> That's what I did my early research on was uh, the economics of information. If you don't have good information, you cannot have good resource allocations. Unfortunately, most people when they make investments don't know the, con the, the risk that I've just described. They don't know the extent to which there is 
either physical risk, the real estate risk, the stranded asset risk, or the transition risks. They don't know the extent to which an asset is intertwined with some other part of the financial system in which there are these high climate risks. And so it is imperative that we have much better disclosure requirements. And several countries are now moving towards that, but it should be done, uh, uh, I think it's imperative that it be done much more quickly. A second example, uh, complementary in many ways, are uh, an understanding of the stresses that the financial and economic system will experience in the response to the climate risk I described, particularly the transition risk, but also the fiscal risk. That a individual firm cannot assess. That's a property of the systemic uh, properties of the financial and economic system. We live in an intertwined economic and financial system. Uh, we saw that very vividly when uh, uh, um, uh, one American firm, Lehman Brothers, went down in 2008 and it brought down that whole financial system. I had written, and many other, a few other people, including at the Bank of England, Andy Haldane, had emphasized that in our intertwined financial system, the collapse of one major financial institution could have large systemic consequences. But our financial regulators at the time, like Ben Bernanke, paid no attention to this important research, or almost no attention. And the result of that was we had to do catch up. We had to have our whole financial system. We had a meltdown. And having learned that lesson, we ought to do, uh, as the expression goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We ought to try to do what we can to prevent that. And that means there has to be stress tests. And those stress tests have to include financial uh, risks associated with climate, uh, both the transition and the fiscal risk. Now, some Republican senators in the United States have criticized the uh, argument that the climate risk is something that the Federal Reserve should pay attention to because they say climate risk is something out there in the distant future, and the Federal Reserve is supposed to be focused on short-term risk. Nothing could be uh, further from the truth because the future in well-functioning markets can suddenly become today. We make investments in fossil fuels. Those can be 30, 40, 50 years investment. We make investments in real estate. Those are 20, 30, 40, 50 year investments. Some of the real estate uh, in the UK is 100 and 200 year uh, real estate investments. Well, you make those investments at some point of time, it will become clear that those are mispriced. At some point of time, it will be clear that the investments in coal, oil, even gas are stranded assets. And so those investments that now are priced on the assumption that the price of oil is going to be $100 forever, will realize that the price is not going to be 100. It's going to be 20, 10, maybe zero. And the result of that is those asset prices are going to come down and we will have financial turmoil. So the question is, when you see these kinds of uh, stresses in our financial system, what can you do? And here, we, we need to use, again, all the tools at our disposal. Carbon pricing, regulation, public action. Uh, when we uh, talk about pricing, we have to both price the risk, we have to price carbon. And uh, we have to evaluate, uh, uh, make judgments about uh, 
the likely or at least possible prices that will be associated with carbon and what will that do to asset prices and therefore what will that do to systemic risk. Uh, the regulations have to take into account that when those prices are uh, uh, adjusted, price of fossil fuels come down, price of uh, exposed real estate comes down, um, that will push enormous, uh, create uh, enormous systemic risk unless the banks, financial institutions have adequate capital requirements. And that's why corresponding to the risk, there has to be risk adjusted capital requirements. That principle that there needs to be risk adjusted capital requirements is a well accepted principle for decades. The only thing is that we have not yet adjusted those capital requirements to reflect the transitional and fiscal risk associated with climate risk. Uh, also in terms of regulation, we have to recognize that our financial institutions are short term and do not do a very good job of risk analysis. Uh, we saw that in, uh, again, 2008. They focus on short-term profits rather than long-term. They use effectively high discount rates rather than the lower discount rates that we would reflect intergenerational justice. They don't take into account risk. That's why our economy and our financial system has not been resilient. And so we have to impose regulations that force them to take a longer term perspective and to take better account of risk. We ought to think about not only changing the regulations, but the governance. We ought to make sure that the governance reflects longer term views. One of my colleagues is working, uh, Patrick Bolton, is working a, a great deal on what are called loyalty shares, changing corporate governance to reflect long-term concerns rather than the short-termism that mark uh, so many in the financial sectors. Uh, there are other tools, I think, uh, that uh, ought to be employed. For instance, uh, in the United States, uh, almost all mortgages are backed by the US government. In most other countries, it's more implicit. In the United States, it's explicit. The government buys the mortgages uh, and, and insures over 90% of them. Well, that's putting risk on the back of the taxpayers. And so I would say in the United States, we shouldn't bear that risk if it has carbon risk. So the only mortgages that should be issued are green mortgages that reflect the, the uh, reality of uh, the risk associated with, with the uh, 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 climate change. Uh, another tool uh, reflecting the fact that our private financial sector is consistently short-term and uh, pays insufficient attention to risk is that we have to create public financial institutions, green banks uh, in the United States, in, even in New York State, we've created a green bank that has helped provide finance, that has helped uh, make sure that there is a better flow of credit to invest in uh, uh, the kinds of investment that help uh, facilitate uh, the green transition. So just let me uh, conclude and, and say that uh, these are all examples of uh, what economists call market failures. Markets uh, are not led as if by an invisible hand to the well-being of society when there are market failures. In this area, market failures uh, are pervasive, uh, not just the market failure of not pricing carbon, but the market failures associated with short-termism, 
with not pricing risk. And therefore, uh, we have to use every instrument at our disposal to try to correct these market failures. And it's only by using all these instruments that we will be able to facilitate rapidly uh, the green transition. Okay, thank you, um, Joseph. That was a um, really great and um, rich speech, which outlined the problems such as mispricing risk and short-termism and actually gave some, I think, concrete solutions, which was um, really great. Um, so we're gonna quickly move into the um, panel debate. In the interest of time, we're going to introduce each panelist separately and they're just gonna give five minutes on their um, views on, on the panel debate we're having now, reshaping finance, a roadmap, net zero and levelling up. So the first speaker is um, Frank Van Leuven. He's a senior economist for the think tank, the New Economics Foundation, and he specialises in monetary and fiscal policy, banking and developmental finance. Um, thanks, Frank. Thanks, Fabrika. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, I can, yeah. Cool. Okay. And, and thanks very much also, Chris, if you're still there. Um, my presentation today will be very quick. It's, it's very much based on previous work that I've been doing with academics such as Daniela Gabor, Maria Nicolavi, uh, Yanis de Fermos, um, Josh Ryan Collins, Dirk Besmer, and, and Hugh Chenet, and, and a few others, as well as my colleagues at NEF, um, Wukaj Krabel and then other co-partners at Positive Money, including David Barnes and, and Simon Yule. So the, the point is, is this presentation is, is very much kind of a joint one, but any mistakes are, are mine. I will effectively, you know, the key points of my presentation are that yes, as Chris highlighted, the government and, and with the leadership of the Bank of England, there's, there's been enormous strides been made. Um, I still think that there's a few problems that need sorting and I'll just put forward some policy solutions towards the end. Now, um, so as Chris, you know, really eloquently highlighted, I do, I really want to be like clear about this. I do think that the UK has undertaken a number of initiatives towards reshaping finance across the regulatory and fiscal and monetary spheres. And then there's been a huge level of progress um, that we've made, including the Greening the Bank of England's um, mandate, um, greening the corporate QE programs and you know, stress tests and, and other types of things that, that are, are being taken, um, undertaken at the moment. And, and now they're also reviewing possible capital requirements. Um, but we need to move effectively from engagement towards really shifting um, capital allocation. And we really need to do this as if you know, we want to save the planet. And that means we have to move quicker. Um, one of the problems we have is there is basically way too much dirty lending. UK banks, since the Paris Climate Agreement, have poured about 22 point, 20, 20, 225 billion into fossil fuels and other types of dirty activities. At the same time, um, there's this huge green finance gap at the moment where we just basically do not have enough green lending and banks lending for green things at the moment. We're supposed to be lending about 10 billion or making 10 billion worth of investment a year at the moment. And eventually that's going to be 60 billion a year. Um, so there's this massive gap and we basically aren't doing enough of that type of lending. The other important point is to suggest that basically our, the, the setup of our current financial system is not geared towards providing the vital um, patient strategic finance needed to support jobs, businesses, and local communities in line with the green um, transition. So before the crisis, a significant share of bank credit went basically to pre-existing assets in the property and real estate sector that basically leads to asset price inflation, um, while very little funding and financing went into SMEs and, and non-financial businesses. Only 2, two to 5% of bank lending basically went to SMEs. 99.9% um, of all businesses are at SMEs. 60% of private sector jobs come from SMEs and 40% of, of GDP comes from um, SMEs. So if the government's plan is to level up in the future, we need to kind of think about how the banking system allocates capital 
capital. And we need to acknowledge that it does so suboptimally at the moment, and we need to, to kind of address that. And given this, it might not be a surprise, as Neff has shown, that since 2019, um, those the better off families um, have basically the richest are 5% or 3,300 pounds better off than when the government first promised to level up. Meanwhile, half of UK families are 110 pounds worse off since the 2019 general election. Part of that has to do with our fiscal framework, um, but the other part has to do with the fact that, you know, the way finance works. Um, the third problem I just want to highlight is that our policy approach at the moment is not consistent with the goals of the green transition. It ignores that banks so, so optimally allocate credit. There's an over-reliance on deregulation, de disclosure, and transparency. There's not enough incentives for green things and not enough penalties for dirty things. Um, and then I'd say that the end, you know, the Treasury and the Bank of England's tools are, are really indirect and they are inconsistent with the, the challenge at hand at the moment. So I'm just going to put forward three simple policy solutions for now. Firstly, I think we need targets. And, and by this, I've put a weighing scale and the MyFitnessPal for the Bank of England. Um, because how do we know that we're greening the financial system if we don't really have proper ways to measure it? Right. And, and if you think you're trying to lose weight, but you don't have a weighing scale, how are you going to do it? But, and, and how are you going to know if you're losing weight if you're not kind of thinking about what you're eating? So and at the same time, the Bank of England now has kind of a new green remit. We think that it should basically possibly have targets. You could have some sort of target, quantitative target that, am, that aims at stimulating a certain amount of green investment or curb a certain amount of dirty investment. Our second big proposal, and this is very much linked to the open to work that Eric does, is that the Bank of England already runs what's called the term funding scheme, which is an emergency facility where it lends to banks for, for very cheap, and it, it basically passes on that cheap credit to banks to lend to firms and households. Now, you could basically just tweak this. You could tweak it so that, that the banks would then have an incentive or a low cost of funding for lending to things like retrofits or for lending to SMEs, and you could make this permanent. The Bank of England, you know, there's the, the green taxonomy is being developed at the moment, so you could link this also to the, the taxonomy. You could also kind of basically tap a, a negative interest rate onto this so, so that basically there's a very cheap level of funding going into the banks that can have then direct incentives to lend for green things. The final thing that I'll say is that the um, People's Bank of China, the Bank of Japan, and the Bank of Korea have already done this. They are doing this. We can learn from them and we can do this. Um, the final thing that I'm going to policy proposal is to consider green capital requirements. Um, there was lots of discussion of disclosure. I think that, that you know it's important, but we really need more substantive things to kind of penalize and disincentivize dirty forms of lending so you could raise um, capital requirements for dirty things. Um, there's this idea of a one-for-one -one capital requirement for the financing of new fossil fuels that could be implemented. It's basically a form of financial regulation that means for each pound that finances new fossil fuels and carbon activities, banks and insurers basically have a pound of their own funds held for potential losses. It would basically make dirty bank lending much more expensive. It would make sure that banks gamble with their own money and not on the public's um, card. Um, the, the final caveats and considerations that I just wanted to throw out there is that central banks cannot go at this alone. We need fiscal change and we need to change the fiscal rules as well. Decisions on what sectors to prioritize and deprioritize need to be made with elected officials. Um, part of the problem also that wasn't mentioned is that fossil fuel companies still invest in dirty things because they don't think the government will transition. And that's a huge, huge problem. So the government also needs to kind of make, make itself more credible. Um, we also need a, a green as well as a dirty taxonomy for these types of proposals to be possible. Um, I'll leave it there. Um, uh, thanks, Frank. Um, yeah, like uh, Joseph Stiglitz's speech, I think there's a lot of ideas for solutions in there, which is great. Um, I quickly want to move on to our next um, speaker. Um, so I'm honoured to introduce um, Kevin Hollerake. He's um, Conservative MP for Thirsk and Moulton and has been an MP since 
May 2015. <laughs> he was born and brought up in his constituency and lives with his wife, Nikki, four children and two dogs. <clears throat> Um, he's currently a member of the House of Commons Treasury Select Committee, and he's co-chair of the APPG on Fair Business Banking, a cross-party group that is a platform in which businesses, trade bodies and parla parliamentarians put forward policy recommendations to create a balanced financial system. Um, thank you, Kevin. Yeah, thank you very much <coughs> for inviting me <coughs> to talk on this very important subject. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, my kind of talk's going to be headed, too many cooks spoil the broth, um, because I'm a little bit concerned, really. I mean, let's be clear about this. The UK is a world leader in terms of tackling climate change. And if you want any independent verification of that, just look at Greenwatch's annual uh, index that it provides, where UK is number two in the world, just behind Sweden and every other country behind is behind uh, the efforts we're taking, not that we're all taking enough efforts, we need to go further and faster and fully sign up to that. Um, also potentially a world leader in green finance, all that is quite a nascent sector at the moment. So um, um, £16 billion pounds of green bonds already raised, of course, in the UK through the Treasury Green Bonds. Um, Climate-related financial, climate related financial disclosures, really positive, and most people welcome that, as I do. Um, the fact that the City of London will be the first net zero aligned financial centre, which is also good. And um, and as we said before, these mandatory transitions, so sectors, industries will have um, a mandatory requirement to decarbonise their um, organisations and their sectors. Um, and all this is overseen, of course, by independent committee, the Committee on Climate Change. So we've got this pretty... Uh, well-structured framework, I think it's fair, I think, in terms of making sure we de decarbonise at the right rate. And the rate the UK is choosing, you could argue it should be faster, but it's as fast as anybody in the world apart from Sweden. So, uh, so certainly impressive credentials, I think. Um, and I totally get the perspective, you know, in terms of finance, it's got to be directed in the right places. I mean, if, you'd, if you were financing uh coal production in the States uh, 10 years ago, you'd have lost 99% of your money. All the owners of the, those coal production facilities would have lost 99% of your money. So clearly, there's got to be judici judicious decisions by financiers to say, is this the right place to put our investment or to support this kind of investment? Um, so I totally get that. Um, but I, I do have a few concerns, really, that too many people start to... And we, we look at the banking sector to save the planet, if you like. I, I don't think that's the banking sector's job. I think, actually, what the banking sector is there to do, the finance sector, is to provide the finance to save the planet and, um, and make decisions on where the, where the, what the direction of the economy is going, the direction of government is going, and when it signals things like uh, move away from, from combustion engines to electric vehicles and uh, other forms of... Um, uh, non-carbon and non-carbon uh, transport then um, obviously that that's going to be a discussion that's going to happen between uh, the bank and the business concerned but um, the unintended consequences could be as Chris was saying before I think the fact you may well see divestment complete divestment so you walk away from sectors that can provide the solutions and need the investment to provide those solutions and of course Yes, of course, a bank needs to look and make sure that business is on the right track and is not going to hit that kind of, not going to become a stranded asset. So, but it really, for me, it's about the government to determine that, determine that framework. And it must take a strategic approach to where we are today and where we're going to be in 2050 with some marker posts along the road. And given that, and given the alignment from those, the, from the, bank, the bank thinks the business is aligned to those marker posts and to the destination, then the finance should continue in my view. Um, otherwise you get, well, Chris alluded to, you get this stuff is uh, uh, potentially divestment. So stuff is uh, bought by private equity houses. And then that stuff because is really finance behind closed doors. You can't do anything about it anyway. So very little influence at that point. And in most of my work, I'm, 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 as you said, um, I'm on the Treasury Select Committee. I'm also co-chair of the All Party Group on Fair Business Banking. 
We do a lot of work in make sure, making sure businesses are treated fairly, particularly SMEs, <clears throat> which tend to have a harder time in, in when things go wrong with their bank. And we had a huge amount of work to do and still do post uh, the gra- uh, global financial crisis. Um, where, where lending was withdrawn in whole sectors from SMEs. And that really meant tens of thousands of businesses went to the wall, good businesses that didn't need to, which is very bad for the recovery, very, very bad for those businesses, and just blatantly unfair. And where I slightly worry on this is, so in my constituency of First and Malton in North Yorkshire, we have a very good business, which I use this analogy quite a lot in this conversation, called the York Handmade Brick Company. And it pretty much does what it says on the tin. It fires handmade bricks that look like old clam bricks and they're very much in demand. Smallish business, 20 odd people work there. But to fire those bricks requires the use of fossil fuels, natural gas in the kilns there, as efficient as they can be. And they've invested to try and make those more efficient. But what I don't want to see, you really don't want to see, is a bank coming along and say, actually, we're decarbonizing our, our business itself, our supply chain, but also our customer base. And actually, you use use natural gas and that's really that's a couple of negative points on our on our on our scoring system in terms of our customer base therefore we want you to go and bank somewhere else because the reality is that business will probably not be able to bank anywhere else and will probably go to the wall if that, if that started to happen so as i say as long as businesses are aligning with the strategic goals the government set out then i think the bank's for me, as long as it's um, the balance, the PL stacks up, the bank should continue to provide finance for those kind of organisations. I think the other problem, um, which I think um, kind of Frank was referring to, which I agree with, is is this thing about what is green or you know what are emissions? I think Chris said, you know, what are emissions? Is that the only factor we look at? And a big problem we're going to see into the future is greenwashing. So things that look green on the surface are not particularly green when you scratch under the surface. And we need those objective criteria that we can all kind of agree on that this uh, defines and determines a green entity or an entity that's, that is transitioning appropriately. I think the other thing we need to do, of course, is make sure we don't simply outsource all our emissions by, uh, as it has happened to a certain extent in the past, so we buy stuff from foreign jurisdictions who aren't, haven't got the oversight we have, who aren't transitioning as quickly as the UK is, but businesses can continue their, their, their high uh, dependency on fossil fuels where they wouldn't be allowed in the UK, because that's clearly a false economy for the, for the uh, planet as well as for our economy. Um, so carbon border taxes is something we've got to look at to make sure this stuff is fair. Uh, other than that, solutions we need to look at, and I agree with some of the stuff that uh, Frank was saying on this, where we've gone wrong in the past, our frameworks for investment, whether it be for SMEs through the Green Homes Grants, trying to get contractors to install, and the Green Homes Grant, which was so short term, it was unbelievable. So it didn't, didn't have time to bed down. Those businesses couldn't invest in terms of their workforce and training up their people to install this stuff, and the customers didn't have time to apply for the money. It all fell apart. Similar with the Green Deal, that was a bit of a... Um, you know, not the most successful time either. So you need really stable frameworks. Um, and again, I, I agree with Frank on something like a, a green term funding scheme option that funds a green version of bounce back loans to really help SMEs to decarbonize, uh, helps consumers. I think in Germany they've had it for a while, just very cheap loans, which again has been referred to earlier, very cheap loans that people uh, know that they can get these loans off the shelf as long as you're investing in decarbonisation and they get them at very cheap rates. So there's, there's solutions like that that definitely can be challenged to our finance sector. But I don't, I really do fear this kind of shareholder uh, pressure, board of directors trying to do the right thing, ESG, all that kind of stuff, and, and really pulling the plug on, on some very important businesses and sectors that are going to help towards this transition that we need. Okay, thank you, um, Kevin. That was a really um, clear speech, especially I think the point you reiterated around the importance of transition finance organisations and not just pulling the plug on, on certain sectors who are trying to transition. Um, Kevin has to leave um, quite soon, so if anybody wants to ask a question, I would um, do it now. I'll ask a question quickly to give people time to put their questions together if they want to. Um, 
So how do we actually get the money where it's needed on the ground, um, do you think, Kevin? Um, is our current banking system an obstacle? And based on your work on the APPG and fair business banking, could you explain how policy could support lending to SMEs, perhaps, by a non-bank challenger lenders? Yeah, OK. So, um, I mean, I think, to be honest, our, banking, our banks did a very good job during the crisis of getting money out the door very quickly. And um, I think some of the claims about how much that money was misallocated in fraud or error has been overblown. I think I don't think the numbers will be anywhere as ba- near as bad. And so that money went out very, the door very, very quickly, which is gives us some confidence that we can do that again, do a new similar scheme if we did do a green um, a green transition loan or something. So and I think um, and they, I think there was great work by the Treasury, the British Business Bank, and the banks themselves to get their money out, and, and indeed the Bank of England. So I think that is a big opportunity for the future if we do decide this is the right way forward. Clearly, there's got to be some uh, checks and balances in, in terms of who's getting the money, but also in terms of where it's being spent. We don't want this to fund a new, uh, a big kind of fleet of Range Rovers or something um, to make sure that money is being spent on decarbonisation and transitioning. I think the other thing we need to learn from the term funding scheme for SMEs was they only went to the banks, didn't go to non-bank lenders. And we want that to go to non-bank lenders, sort of like Tide, Iwaka, these kind of people, uh, funding circle, as well as to the to our main banks. I think that was where it went slightly wrong, but nevertheless, a huge effort delivered very quickly, and, uh, and now a template that we can use for the future. I think alongside that, in terms of consumers, a similar thing, as I said before, um, you're really probably emulating what's happening in Germany in terms of very, very cheap loans that you can take over a significant period of time to spend on on uh, mitigation, things like insulation and uh, heat pumps or whatever else it is. So uh, making it easy for people to make good decisions in terms of how they decarbonise. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to introduce our next um, panelist. Um, it's great to introduce Rishanara Ali. Um, she's Labour MP for Bethnal Green and Bo, and she's been an MP since May 2010. Um, like Kevin, she grew up in a constituency and she was the first in her family to go to university studying philosophy, politics and economics at Oxford University. Um, until her resignation from Labour's front bench in September 2014 over her decision to abstain on the vote on airstrikes in Iraq, um, she served as Shadow Minister for Education and Young People and Shadow Minister for International Development. Um, in April 2016, she was appointed as the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy to Bangladesh. Um, the cross-party programme established in 2012 aims to build business and bilateral trade relationships and help drive economic growth in developing countries. Um, thank you, Vishnala. Well, thank you very much. And it's great to join my fellow MP from the Treasury Committee. Um, we, we, um, uh, it's an interesting committee to be in. and. It's really great to be uh, part of a panel where there are lots of ideas ca- um, coming through, which uh, which we as parliamentarians very much benefit from. And there's quite, although there are differences of perspective, lots in in terms of um, common themes coming through in the discussion. Uh, so, and I, I think in this agenda, we need collective thinking, collective efforts across parties across institutions, between policymakers, regulators, businesses, and civil society, because the climate crisis is going to, as somebody said during the pandemic, is going to make the COVID crisis and pandemic look like a dress rehearsal. And this is the uh, challenge of our times and time's running out, as we know. And we've seen that with the great campaigning led by young people uh, in particular um, uh, that's highlighted. So the role of civil society is really crucial here. Uh, and the role of, of course, government businesses and regulators uh, is vital here. So what I, would, and, uh, what I would say is that in the last decade, while there's been it, recent changes that the government's made uh, particularly some of the innovations that are happening uh, in terms of finance uh, and decarbonisation. I would argue that we've we've had a bit of a lost decade when it comes to climate. Uh, 
for a whole range of different reasons, uh, post-global financial crisis, and then in the UK context, uh, the Brexit crisis, and of course, more recently with the pandemic. But we need to use these. We need we need to we need to make sure we learn from the crises we've faced, uh, and we need to ensure that we are not responding in uh, in a short termist way. And what we've seen uh, in uh, certainly when I served in the Energy and Climate Change Committee is investors who want to invest in green growth, green jobs, and decarbonization saw subsidies being removed too quickly. Uh, they want stability, they want clarity. What, we, what we've seen is the removal, certainly in the, um, in the first uh, period of the, in 2015, for instance, a number of uh, uh, subsidies that were removed. Uh, those long-term subsidies were really vital in helping households uh, uh, reduce their emissions through uh, direct support. Uh, it's uh, and Kevin mentioned the point about a uh, short term investment, uh, not long enough to see the fruits of the investment from government, for instance, more recently. So we need to we need clarity, we need stability uh, and a more strategic response in terms of looking at how we address the challenge that we face, because while different governments, my party introduced the Climate Change Act, the first uh, of its kind, which was um, replicated in other countries, uh, all, all of us need to look at how we have a longer term strategy uh, towards net zero and decarbonization and meet those global commitments that we've made because commitments can be made, but they are not, they're not worth their salt if we can't meet those objectives. Um, I just I wanted to focus uh, particularly on the data that was shared earlier about the um, the amount of money that the financial institutions pour into fossil fuels. So, twenty two hundred twenty five billion was mentioned earlier, I think, by Frank. Um, now, that's that that five banks have contributed to that sort of that that sort of uh, uh, investment in fossil fuels uh, over over a few years. How do we make sure that the financial services in our economy, which are a very vital part of our economy, don't make matters worse? Because that's what's been happening. So while I recognize that banks can't fix the climate crisis, what they need to stop doing is fueling the cri climate crisis, which is what's been happening. And whoever's in government uh, needs to ensure that that is addressed because if we can make sure that the transition uh, towards net zero uh, while governments are trying to achieve that is not being undermined which is essentially what's happening right now uh, and has been happening for a long time then that would make that would help us to uh, achieve uh, greater progress what we also need to do is make sure that government investment in net zero is much greater than what it is, which is why we need to lead by example. Uh, and while I'm not, uh, I'm not dis dismissing the interventions that the government has made more recently, we need to do more. The Labour Party is committed to, uh, has made a pledge to put in 28 billion pounds extra each year, every year up to 2030 for, uh, as part of its green investment pledge. I want to see the current government match that. Uh, it's not a, it's not going to be enough what we're doing at the moment. Although what's being what's being done is welcome, we need to make sure that. Uh, and this is a wider point about the our international commitments, as well as not fueling in, fueling uh, uh, the problem, making it worse. We need to make sure that we support the most vulnerable economies and countries uh, by by honoring the pledge of 100 billion uh, pounds to help developing countries cut emissions and adapt to climate change, uh, while at the same time making sure that those economies are not being financed to, um, you know, the, the, the financial uh, support that's going in uh, is green. Now, I recognize that the transition, and it needs to be a, 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 another point, which is linked to our relationships with the rest of the world and what we do, is in a globalized world economy where we rely on each other, where we're in, interdependent, and the pandemic proved 
precisely how interdependent we are. And we're seeing the consequences of that. We're continuing to see the consequences of that. We can't act alone, but we need to, we need to support each other. Uh, so the, the cuts in overseas aid uh, is not actually going to help the climate agenda. We need to make sure that alongside providing the finance, the 100 billion that developing countries need, that other objectives are not undermined either. We've got to make sure the big polluters face the pressure and that's where government comes in. Government could do much more to bear down on those who are the biggest polluters uh, and who are, who are financing fossil fuel. I, d I think that there's a legitimate point about making sure that it is done without unintended consequences, but that, that phrase must not be used for as, a, as an excuse for inaction. And then another agenda which we haven't talked about, which is a broader point, uh, not so much to do with finance, is about protecting nature and ending deforestation. But it's connected because we've seen how uh, how uh, banks have operated, investors have operated. And again, that's where the global um, partnerships are crucial. That's where citizens holding governments to account, whether here in our country and regulators uh, and others to account to make sure it doesn't happen is crucial. And that's where the roles, role of NGOs uh, has been really vital in what they're doing as well as campaigners. So I think in, in summary, what I would say is that in, more, in, the, in the recent years, we've seen a greater uh, sense of urgency. I think it's really encouraging to see what the Bank of England's doing, what the PRA is doing. Uh, our committee uh, led, uh, conducted an, in, an inquiry into decarbonisation of green finance. Uh, it's good to see that dialogue. When I first joined the Treasury Committee, uh, it seemed like a niche issue for a treasury committee to look at. And, and we worked very hard to, to, you know, as a group of, you know, cross-party MPs to make sure it's, it's, it takes centre stage as an agenda in parliament and thinking about finance and climate. Um, I think there are great opportunities to look at how we decarbonize through our, um, our financial system. And because Britain despite Brexit and, and everything else that's happened, because Britain's got this very, very big financial services sector, while the financial services sectors, you know, I'm not saying they are there, they're gonna be able to save the planet. Um, they're gonna play, they're gonna, if we get this right, they can play a critical role in influencing what happens across the planet. So, so I think that we need to ensure that the government has a clear strategy there's been a lot of chopping, chopping and changing over the last decade uh, and a clear uh, set of proposals backed by resources with the right incentive structures for businesses to be able to make that transition. This, their second part is the government, our government, as well as governments across the world, are, is, are, are going to need to think very hard about how to do the just transition piece. And that's where the levelling up agenda is so important. Uh, we need to recognize that if the costs are borne or passed on to those who are struggling already, that's not going to be a just tr transition. That's not going to achieve the leveling up agenda. It's going to work against it. So those with the broader shoulders will need to carry the greatest, uh, greatest um, uh, responsibility here. That applies in terms of citizens within our own country, it, in terms of regions, uh, where, where, where we've got some regions poorer, very significantly poorer than others, but within regions as well. And of course, across nations. And unless we do that, we're going to, we're going to lose the much needed time that we, well, we still, we don't have uh, anymore, but we're going to set ourselves back even further. Just this week, the IPCC, the IPCC report uh, indicated that 40% of the world's population is highly vulnerable to climate now. So while I welcome some of the recent initiatives that have been introduced by government, it's not enough to achieve the objectives we need in order to uh, reverse the damage that's already been done and meet our green uh, climate targets. So. We, we all need to think very hard about how we address this crisis. 
And what we, uh, and, the, and the final thing I'd say is in relation to our experience of the pandemic, what we've seen, and Kevin's alluded to it, other speakers have alluded to it as well. What we've seen is that if governments want to act when there's a crisis right before them, they can. The political will um, can, be, can be there, uh, but in relation to climate, we can't do it at the last minute. We can't do it as the crisis hits because the crisis is already there. We've got to act now uh, and we've got to be bold. We've got to be radical and we've got to be ambitious. And this is one agenda where we have to come together both as an international community, but also as a domestic community across uh, business society uh, uh, and government and parties to achieve the lasting change that we need to protect our climate, to protect the future. Um, okay, thank you, um, Wishanawa. That was a very rich speech and you packed in a lot of information in a very short space of time, so thank you. And I think it was great that you brought in the global perspective on this and also the importance of the just transition. Um, I'm just gonna quickly move on to our last speaker, um, who is Eric um, Lonergan. Um, he's a macro hedge fund manager, economist and writer. Um, his most recent book is an international bestseller in political economy um, called Angrynomics. And um, prior to Angrynomics, he's written Money. Um, and he's also written for publications such as Foreign Affairs and Financial Times and The Economist, and he advises governments and policymakers. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and thank you uh, to Nath and to Frank for inviting me to talk. It's been really, really interesting. I've really enjoyed uh, listening to everybody. Um, I should also say that I've, I've uh, just written a book with uh, Karin Soares um, on the transition to net zero, which uh, deals with a lot of these issues called Supercharge Me. So I'm going to be drawing on a number of the observations uh, in the book. Um, the first thing I want to say is that as a, as a participant within the financial system, the cultural change within, I would say, the last two years is quite astonishing. So I actually think that there is a dramatic, overwhelming change within the financial system in Europe uh, oriented around climate change. And I would say, broadly speaking, it is both profound and extremely encouraging. But I want to make a number of points. Um, the first thing I think that's probably the most important is, and this goes to the kind of too many cooks point, is that there is a complete lack of clarity about what our objectives are. In fact, I'm struck by this in virtually every one of these panels that I participate in. Um, so the first question when I attend meetings on ESG or meetings about bank regulations or government policy is I want to know what are we actually trying to achieve um, beyond the obvious, which is reduce emissions. And what are we actually trying to achieve? How are we proposing to collapse emissions? Uh, and I, so I want to talk about that very briefly. Then what I want to talk about is what can policy do? So what should we be looking for fiscal and monetary policy to do in, other, in order to steer the financial system? And then the third thing I wanna look at are what are the risks? So I, call, I think of the risks within the financial system as the three hyphens, right? Which is greenwashing, mis-selling and free riding. I think most of those have been raised, but I wanna to talk to them. And then I wanna go back to Joseph Stiglitz's point about who's gonna lose. So where are the big losses um, and how do we address them? Are they big losses? Should we be worried about them? Okay, so the first point is, what are we actually trying to achieve? Um, and I think this will, becomes extremely relevant to the financial sector, because once we're clear about what we're trying to achieve, actually the role of finance and the specific axes that we want finance to move along become really clear. Now, how do we collapse emissions rapidly on a, on a five to 10 year time horizon. Right. The first component of any serious plan, and I should say I've drawn heavily here on the work of Adair Turner at the ETC, which I think is superb on this. All of the publications they've written on electrification are very compelling. So the first primary objective is that we make electricity generation 
as close to 100% sustainable. We won't be able to get to 100% sustainable. That's not really the point. The point is we have to push it to the limit, right? So we need to get as much of electricity generation as is possible driven by wind and solar. That's the first point. Then we need to get all areas of the economy where we have the existing technology to be run off the grid, right? So we then need transport to be run off the grid, manufacturing to be run off the grid, and all of the energy requirements for our buildings to be run off the grid. Now, the, now if we do that, right, that is 70 to 75% of our emissions. Right? The electricity sector alone, depending where you are, but 25 to 30% of your emissions. And that can be done at a five year time horizon, to be perfectly honest, because we are actually extremely lucky because alternative energy has very short lead times. That's the first area in which we're extremely lucky. So we're already seeing this in Germany. How is Germany able to bring, because of Russia, its energy transition forward from 2050 to 2035? It's because actually it only takes you 18 months to ins install solar power. Right? And if you look at um, what the UK has done with offshore wind, you can do it within five years. We're actually extremely lucky because the lead times are so short. We're also extremely lucky because we are the generation with the lowest cost of capital in history. And I keep making this point because I have about 20 books on climate change on my desk. And the first thing I do with every new book on climate change that comes out is I go to the index and I see, does it talk about the cost of capital? Now, why do I expect it to talk about the cost of capital? Well, because what I have just described is a huge challenge of capital expenditure. Right. Electricity is run is is in, in virtually all of the developed world are, is a regulated utility. Right? If you look at the UK, we have a regulator that can pretty much determine how much investment spending the national grid does. And in fact, the investment uh, returns of the entire generating sector. Now, that is entirely a function of the cost of capital. So the key objective that we should all be trying to do is we should be trying to collapse the cost of capital within electricity generation. And then we should be dramatically skewing the incentives of transport, of buildings, and of manufacturing so that all of their energy needs are done from electricity. And finance is absolutely at the heart of those objectives. Okay, so let me just quickly go through how we might like do these, these points. I've, I've got, I think I've got about three or four minutes. I'll, I'll, do, I'll try and do it in three minutes. There are many elements of nuance, but the first one where we should absolutely be focused is on how do we increase investment spending in electricity generation within regulated utilities? Because there's not nearly enough discussion about this. Now, if you go back to this, this is a very simple point. How do I get investors to accelerate the capital expenditure within electricity? The first thing I need to do, actually, your returns are relatively predictable in forms of economic activity, right? Because you get a regulated electricity price. And so your returns are pretty, pretty deterministic by economic standards. How do you alter the cost of capital? The first thing you can do is de-risk the electricity price. Right? And the UK has illustrated extremely powerful how to do this with CFDs for offshore. Effectively, what CFDs, if you're not familiar with them, is effectively you're protecting the electricity price to an investor in the electricity sector. Now, to illustrate how powerful that effect is, if I look within wind generation at the moment in the UK, if you get the private sector to take electricity price risk, they have a discount rate of about somewhere between seven and 10%. In other words, they need to make seven or to 10% returns in order to make those investments. Now, if you de-risk, if you remove electricity price risk, the discount rate, the returns they're trying to make are closer to three or 4%. Now, to me, it is obvious that we should absolutely de-risk the electricity price. So we should do this wholesale. In addition, what we should do is we should use the state's balance sheet quite clearly to provide guarantees because we want to bring down the discount rate, right? This is just exactly like, how would you get more people to do buy to let is you bring down mortgage interest rates. If you want to get more people if you want to get the electricity generating system in the United Kingdom or across Europe or the developed world or the developing world to accelerate its investment, you must reduce its cap cost of capital and set very, very rigorous investment targets via the regulator. 
That's point number one. Now, very briefly as an aside, this is where ESG goes awry. Because if you look at what's happening to the cost of capital in European utilities, what does an ESG system do? By which I mean, you know, for those not familiar, environmental and social governance, if you just score businesses, that's counterproductive. So if I I go, well, I mean, look at the national grid. The national grid currently in the UK has actually got quite a big carbon footprint because it's supporting all of these gas generators. That's not really the point. Right? We do not want to increase their cost of capital. We need What we need to do is we want to increase the cost of capital on the development of gas and oil, but we want to collapse the cost of capital in, in developing the grid infrastructure, in developing storage, in developing pumped hydro, in developing offshore wind, in developing solar, because particularly um, given the variability of those sources of electricity, you need way more capacity than just at peak intervals and you need to build infrastructure and storage. Right? So, But that becomes obvious to you when you're clear about what your objectives are. So that's the first point. Now, the second point then is how do we shift everybody onto the grid? And here I think finance is again profoundly important because this again is about the return on capital and the cost of capital, right? So, so let me take one example and I'll kind of wrap up here and then we, we, we can go to Q&A. It, let's look at the success stories. So the success stories of behavioral change, uh, if you look at Scandinavia, somewhere like Norway currently, how does Norway currently have 95% of sales of motor vehicles or electric vehicles? It's not rocket science. They haven't actually used a carbon tax. That's not how they've done it. They've targeted the relative price of substitutes. Okay, that's the key term that one wants to, to be thinking about. Not, not simply blanket carbon taxes. Blanket carbon taxes are absolutely pointless. What we act because price elasticity of demand is so inelastic. What we need to do is create substitutes and then price the substitute, i.e., the green alternative must be lower price than the carbon intensive alternative. So why is there 95% electric vehicle sales in, in Norway today? Well, because they're close substitutes because you have a charging infrastructure. And if you go into a Volkswagen dealership, it's 20% cheaper. Not only that is it 20% cheaper, it's 50% lower tax, it's 50% lower tolls. So actually the question is why on earth, what, what are the 5% doing that are still buying fossil fuel vehicles? It's nuts. So if we wanna change behavior at scale, we need to go sector by sector, and we need to target the relative price of substitutes. And we need to use fiscal policy and monetary policy to do that. So what do I mean? What I mean is we want to say to take the steel sector. The steel sector is 7% of global emissions, right? seven times more significant than the UK economy. What would I do? We already have the technology to produce green steel. We have the technology. It's just more expensive than the carbon intensive version. So what do you do? You say, well, we will give you a corporate tax holiday. We will give you subsidized loans. We will have term funding schemes. We, we, will use, we will have VAT exemptions. We will use every tool within our power to make sure that green steel is 30% cheaper than carbon intensive steel. And you literally do that sector by sector. Okay, so to summarize, what I'm saying here is, is that what we're really dealing with, and we need to be clear about this, is a huge capital investment program, which has two, two dimensions to it. The first one is our regulated utilities. We need to make electricity sustainable, and then we need to get everything on the grid. And the way to do that using the financial system is to target the, the cost of capital. Right, so what we want to do is we want to skew, we do not want a level, level playing field, we want a, an unbalanced playing field, which is skewed hugely in the favor of the green alternative to the carbon intensive alternative. And the financial system is doing that. I'll just, if I could just give one final example on this to show how important what's happening is, if you take Shell as an example, it's really interesting. You're talking about an oil company. They haven't just woken up and become ethical individuals. This is being motivated by their shareholders. Shell is currently discounting. It will not do any oil investment. It has a discount rate of in excess of 20%. So a 20% hurdle rate of return for oil investments. For offshore wind, it's doing offshore wind between 6 and 8%. Now that, if you think about it, is precisely what we want to happen. We want to collapse the cost, cost of capital for green investments 
dramatically increase the cost of capital um, for polluting investments. And I think that the job of all of us operating within the financial sector is to keep our eye on what our objective is. And policy needs to really shift these incentives in favor of the good actors. Okay, um, thank you, Eric. Again, that was a very, I think, illuminating um, speech. And, and what I took from that, correct me if I'm wrong, is that instead of maybe a blanket carbon price, which people often call for, you, you think we should target sector by sector and make the green substitute effectively cheaper than the carbon intensive one. Okay, that's interesting. And maybe we can go back to that in the Q&A. Um, so the, the panelists can, um, so not the panelists, the audience can ask questions in the Q&A box. Um, I've got one quickly for um, Wishanara and myself. Um, as part of your membership of the um, Treasury Select Committee, which I, forgive me, I forgot to mention, um, how do you think the governance of finance and net zero transition could be strengthened? Including accountability to Parliament, such as to the Treasury Select Committee, which you are a member of, or do you think we need a new committee or body to do this? Could be that Rashnara is frozen. Yeah, she's frozen on my screen, so perhaps she cannot speak at the moment. Okay, I'll go to Eric um, then. Um, so there's a question about your sector by sector idea from the audience. If we are to go sector by sector, who should design sectorial green policies and targets? Is this an industrial innovation, sorry, policy revival? Well, the first point I make is that <clears throat> I actually think it's relatively straightforward which sectors we need to prioritize. So, so in principle, this isn't very difficult. Um, you know, we, we know where the big sources of emissions are. So the first sector that we have to target is electricity generating. Um, we then have to target transport. Uh, these are areas where we have the technology by and large. We then have to target manufacturing. And the big sectors within manufacturing are things like steel and cement. And then there are, there are very difficult areas like agriculture and food. But I think exactly the same principle applies. So I would apply the principle that the you know, Norwegians are applying to electric vehicles, as are the Chinese. It's hugely successful. I, I call it an epic. Right? It's an extreme positive incentive for change. And I think we should do that in all areas that we're, where we're trying to dramatically alter behaviors. Take, take a very simple example at the other end of the spectrum. If you think about uh, plant-based burgers, I mean, I'm shocked when you do the numbers on it. Most meat consumption, most beef consumption in America, 50% of it goes into hamburgers. Okay. How are you going to change behavior? Well, whenever I go into a Burger King now, I just look, what's the price of the Impossible Burger? Why isn't it 30% cheaper? Now, is that industrial policy? I mean, let's be honest, that's blindingly obvious. Let's just go through all of the sectors. Let's go through green steel. Let's go to green cement. Let's go to green mortgages. Let's just, and just let's make sure, because there's a really important point here, which is about the political economy of this. I think, I think the movement has made, and, and, and policy advisors are still making a huge mistake, which is to associate taxation with green policies and, and net zero. Because actually what you want to win hearts and minds is you want people to have the perspective that actually it's it's in their financial and economic interest, which by and large it is, um, to have the green transition. Okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, Mushanara Ali needs to be in that. No, okay, she isn't. Okay, um, so we've got a general question, um, I think, to anybody in the, in the panel. Macroeconomic models generally still don't include money, the financial sector or market fictions, so effectively ignore systemic risk. How can it be that mainstream models have not evolved since then? Doesn't that risk a repeat of 2008? What can, should be done about this? Um, Frank perhaps can take this or Eric, I think would be good. Either of you. Yeah, sure. Um, I think <laughs> okay, I think you I can attempt to briefly respond to this. Um, I'll also just send a link to a paper that I wrote that kind of deals with this 
not necessarily the fact that certain models don't necessarily include a financial sector, but more about how to, how to deal with certain types of risks. But the first thing I should, what I think about climate change and climate related risks and environmental risks is, is, is they're fundamentally uncertain. Um, and there's huge tail risks there. They are systemic, partly because of the, the endogenous nature of them, which means that basically a lot of them depend on, on the, the interaction between players and end market players within the financial system. Um, so I would say what we should be doing is taking in that sense, when there's so much uncertainty, you should be taking a precautionary approach, which says, you know, if you can't measure those risks, then, then, then assume the worst. Um, there's some thinking about how, how to do that in, in practice, but that, that, is, that should, the, 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 the thinking right now, if you hear Al Gore speak, he'll say, first measure, then act, yeah? And if you can't measure, don't act um, effectively and, and, and that we shouldn't change our nature. And, and, and the precautionary approach shifts the burden of proof in the other direction. On, on, in terms of modeling, I will say this, that there's, there's quite a few issues with modeling. If you're interested, I would suggest kind of looking at the work of Irena Monasterolo and Stefano Battiston, who do kind of probably the most advanced modeling on climate-related financial risks and the financial sector. Um, but yes, when you look at World Bank and IMF models, IAM, IAMs and DSGE models, a lot of times the banking sector is not included. Um, possibly the bigger issue, I'd say, is that second or third or fourth round types of risks, the feedback loops between sectors and what happens is not taken into account on, on, on that side. Um, I'll put a link into, the, into that paper below that. Okay, I'll just make one point on this, because it's a, it's a, I, I was actually a little bit surprised by what Joe Stiglitz said here, because I think there's a lot of scaremongering about the financial risks associated with stranded assets. Right. If you look at the numbers, um, fossil fuel assets have been falling in value now for about 15 years on the stock market. Right. So let me just give some very quick numbers on this, because we really do not have to worry about people's pension funds or some kind of financial disaster by virtue of, of eliminating the fossil fuel industry. We really don't. Um, if you look at the, the, the total value of fossil fuel assets listed on the stock market, they're about $5 trillion. Now, most people go, wow, that's a huge number, $5 trillion. And again, it's a bit like the bank lending number. I think it can be very misleading to present these numbers just in billions or trillions, right? So $5 trillion of value of fossil fuels, that'll be terrible for everybody's pensions if, if, if that gets goes to zero. Actually, it won't be because the total market value of the global stock market is 450 trillion, right? So you're actually just talking about one and a half percent. Right? Now, one and a half percent is what the stock market moves at the moment in about a couple of hours, right? Ordinarily in about a week, right? So this is, you know, the stock market during the pandemic fell by about 50%. We lost hundreds of trillions of dollars, right? So we're talking about five trillion. Actually, that's not a big issue. Um, and the other thing that's related to that is if you look at the global labor force, how many people are employed in the fossil fuel industry. It's around 1% of the global labor force. Now, again, if you look at a typical economic cycle, the unemployment rate moves by multiples of that. So I, I really think the issue of the financial losses um, associated with fossil fuel assets is much lower than people are preoccupied about. Um, and, and one thing that's important to bear in mind, this is the upside of the extremes in wealth inequality that we have. You know, if you look at most fossil fuel assets are owned by what I call the, the thugocracies, the theocracies and the 1%, right? So you have the thugocracies, we don't need to, we don't need to call them by name, we all know who they are. We have the theocracies, ditto. And then we have the 1% which owns the stock market. And the reality is even for the 1% that owns the stock market, it's actually a relatively trivial share of the stock market. So I really would not be worried worried about um, some kind of a major uh, financial crisis associated with the losses of the transition. Obviously, if we get climate change, you know, um, if we lose control of the global climate, then, then we'll have a lot more than a financial crisis. Um, thanks, Eric. And I think um, Wishanara is back. So we're coming close to time. So we'll, we'll end the question for her. And I just want to quickly say that Eric's new book, um, Supercharge Me is linked in the chat if you want to check it out. 
Um, so um, thanks for getting back online um, with Shanara. Um, I just quickly want to ask about your membership of the Treasury Select Committee. So how do you think the governance of finance and net zero transition could be strengthened, including accountability to Parliament, such as the Treasury Select Committee, which you are a member of? Or do you think we need a new committee or body to do this? Sorry, thank you very much. And apologies, my internet was playing up, but I, um, uh, I'm able to get back on. So I think we, I think it's really important that the uh, committees that are already there do um, do the work. But certainly in the context of the, you know, the, the work on the future of financial regulation post Brexit, obviously we need to make sure that committees like ours. Um, have the resources and and support uh, in order to do additional work, which is bound to be the case, to, to do the scrutiny appropriately and uh, correctly. And that's the subject of a paper the Tre Treasury Committee published last year. Uh, and this is very much a live discussion um, at the moment. I think that, I think it was a mistake of the government actually to um, uh, scrap the Energy and Climate Change Committee. Uh, some of the points that Eric has made um were were you know were brought up some years ago when that committee existed and uh the department the merger of energy and climate change uh, department with bays while there could be some benefits there are also disadvantages if this agenda gets sucked into other things um, and doesn't get the attention that it needs. And certainly on the scrutiny function, um, uh, getting rid of that committee when the department merged was, was I think, really problematic. Um, we, so we need to make sure that the Bayes committee has the resources it needs, as well as our committee, to do the scrutiny um, uh, further. I think that the, certainly it's very valuable to have the Bank of England um, and the FCA and, and, and PRA coming to our com committee where we're able to hold their feet to the fire, raise those, those points that have been made uh, today and elsewhere about um, uh, targets, timelines, clarity, line of sight. Those things are really important because otherwise I think a lot of institutions can get uh, stuck in thinking about inputs and not enough about outputs and results. So I think the the parliamentary scrutiny part is point is well made. Um, having those decision makers in front of us is cru crucial. I think, as I say, I think the the point about Eric made. A, apologies, I couldn't hear all of it. Made very important points about decarbonisation across different industries within our own country. Uh, which I was touching on a bit in in my remarks, but he he put it much more clearly than I could have done. Um, a parliament needs to give much greater attention to that and have the capacity to to do so. Okay, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we have um, run out of time. Um, I'd like to say thank you to to all the panelists for a very um, thought provoking. Um, discussion. I think this will be recorded, so I think we'll be able to, I hope, we might listen back to this if you wish. Um, thanks all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Rupert and Eric. It was really interesting. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.